Good morning, everyone. I think all the kids are on their way down. And it's nice to see when you have so many kids, eh? When they leave for Sunday school or their classes, like half the congregation, you know? So it's the next generation being taught the Word of God and being taught the truth of God downstairs. And, you know, when we're dead and gone, they'll be able to pick up the flag and keep going. My name is Doug Durrett. Uh, I'm an elder here at Living Hope Church. If you don't know me, uh, from time to time we get to speak. The elders of the church get to speak. And uh, we're going through a series today which is called Call to be Free. And it's a study in the book of Galatians. And we've been there for the last several weeks. And when you look at Galatians, Galatians is the study of our freedom in Christ. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And Paul's writing this letter to the Galatians as the charter or the compass to Christian freedom, so to speak. Because you see, you can come to church all your life, you can read 10 chapters of scripture a day, and you can do ministry until you're blue in the face. And a lot of times what will happen is you'll just fall into the motions of doing that. And you can miss a lot of times through legalism, the plan of God for your life. And you can miss the intimacy of a relational God. And sometimes in the church, believe it or not, you can miss the gospel message altogether. If your eyes are not on God and they're not on Christ. So we're going to look a little bit today. What, were the, what was happening to the Galatians? How does it relate to us today? And see where the truth leads us today. So let's pray before we start. Father, I thank you this morning for your presence. God, how awesome it is as your people to be able to serve a father as you, Lord. God, that you come and you meet with us and you speak with us. And God, you're always there for us. God, this morning you're going to speak your truth to us one more time. So God, I'm asking that the hearts of the people, of your people, Lord, they'll be open to be able to hear your word. And Lord, that the hidden things in our lives, God, maybe the things that we thought we were okay with, God, those things will be exposed this morning. And God, that you'll put your truth there. And God will be able to follow you in spirit and in truth. So Father, this morning, help me to disappear, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would take over this message. God, is, the gospel is always about its content, Lord. It's never about the messenger. So Father, I pray, Lord, that you would open up our hearts to hear, our ears to hear, Lord. And we thank you for your word. And we, God, I just thank you. Thank you for your presence. We thank you that you're here with us. And we praise your name. We give glory to your name today. In Jesus' name, amen. So like I said, today we're going to look a little bit into what Paul was saying to the Galatians in relation to their freedom through Christ as his children, opposed to settling into their own way, their old ways, and their old way of living. Because a lot of times what they were doing, they were trying to follow a set of standards, and they were trying to set, follow a set of rules, thinking that religion was going to help them. The things that they were doing was going to be able to help them and it was going to keep them in the, in, in the end, instead of putting their faith in Christ. So you see, the Galatian Christians, what was happening is, and I'll give you just a little recall here, it says they were, they were being intimidated. They were listening to the voices of false teachers in their day, telling them that what Paul taught them, that faith in Christ alone, it wasn't sufficient for salvation. That's what was being taught. And it doesn't matter where you turn today. It seems like those voices are kind of the same. You can turn on Christian television today and you'll see that they're, they're mixing like mixture with, with, with truth and, and, and half, half truth all together. And they're putting it out to the people. And the people are just gobbling it up, thinking that, oh, this is the right way. And a lot of times what will happen is you'll get caught up in that. If you don't know truly what the gospel is, if you don't truly know your word, you'll get caught up in those things, especially if your eyes are not set on Christ. So the false voices that Paul stood against were saying Christians have to follow the law of Moses in, in addition to their newfound faith in Christ. So there was this mixture that was trying to come in. And you know, when you look on TV also today, the highly ranked voices of primetime TV are pretty much saying the same thing. You know, they're saying things like, Jesus isn't the only way. There's many paths to heaven, and you hear it all the time. But the Bible is completely contrary. The Bible said there's no man that comes to the Father except through Jesus. There's no man that comes to him except for Jesus. Hallelujah. But because of the pressure, 
Because of intimidation and the fear, and you know, the Galatians were falling back into this religion of ritualistic works. Just like many Christians are doing today, because you see, a lot of people don't want to be found going against the grain. A lot of people don't want to have people think differently of them. And they're scared of what people might think of them. So they would rather keep religion and to be a slave to that type of lifestyle rather than have Jesus set them free. And it makes no sense. But when you think back in your life, I've done it. And probably you've done it too. You see, Jesus said this in Matthew 22, that the entire law rests on two great commandments. It says, you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. Jesus said, this is the great and the foremost commandment. And he said, the second one is just like it. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, here's a few questions for you this morning before we get into the actual message. Who can possibly claim even to have come close to keeping the first great commandment? Have you, from your earliest memory, always loved God completely? With all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, all day, every day long? It says this, was me, this would mean that you would have to always obey Him. Because the Bible says if you don't obey me, you don't love me. It would mean that He always has been the center of all of your waking thoughts. His will has been at the center of every decision that you've made. His glory has been your supreme desire in whatever you think and whatever you say and whatever you do. It says you begin every day by worshiping him. You love his word more than food and you meditate on it day and night. Who in their right mind here can say, you just described me? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. I was waiting for somebody to stand up. <laughs> I know if Alex was here, he'd probably be like, me, me, me. <laughs> I wish he was going to hear because I was going to say, Alex, it says, who in the right mind? <laughs> I love that, man. You know, when we look at the second great commandment, we don't do any better, do we? Love our neighbor as ourselves. You know, have we always, you know, if we look from childhood, have we always gladly shared our toys as toddlers? Those that have toddlers here, you know, right away they start to mind, mind, mind. In school, did you always put others ahead of yourself? Have you always put your mate's needs ahead of your own? <laughs> Have you always treated your children with love and kindness, even when they're disobedient? At work, did you rejoice when your co-workers got the promotion that you thought that maybe you deserved? Ooh. Again, who in their right mind can say, this guy? We can't. And it's only two commandments, folks. That's only two commandments. Out of ten. Not to mention, go read the first five books of the Bible. God set up a law in there for every aspect of people's lives. Every aspect. And the Galatians wanted to go back to following this. And Paul was saying, it's, it's, you're going to be a slave. You're going to be a slave. Why would you want to live as a slave? And Paul fought for the Galatians and he told them, folks, God gave the law to reveal his standards of absolute righteousness, to convict us of our true guilt before him, so that we would see our need for the gospel and a savior. That's why he put the law there in front of them. And Paul was trying to show the Galatians, don't you understand? You're falling back into a place where the law that you want to keep, it condemns you. That's all it does is it condemns you. You can't be a good person because in order to be declared good, you'd have to never mess up, ever, ever. From, from childbirth until the day that God calls you home, you would have had to have followed everything to a T. But Paul knew that that life, it didn't produce anything good. You know, what? the only thing that it produced was a cycle of we try really hard, we fail really well, and then all this guilt comes in, and then we're left empty. That type of lifestyle without Christ, that's what it does. It's just that continual circle. Instead of, you know, Paul was saying, instead of standing strong on the pure gospel, allowing Christ to rule in your lives, and let Christ move you from every aspect of your life into freedom. But the Galatians, like us at times, what happens is they go after other sources of freedom. 
or what they think or what we think freedom looks like. And a lot of times it's only to our detriment because, you know, adding anything, folks, anything to the gospel produces chains and bondage. You want to know why? Because God doesn't need any help being God. He doesn't need my help and he doesn't need your help. He's well capable of, of moving us into freedom. You know, but a lot of times we think, oh, let's help God a little bit and we'll go do our own thing. And this is what Paul was up against. So even though we profess Jesus, how many times can you relate that fear, intimidation caused you maybe to pull back from the plan of God? And I know there's been lots of times in my life that that's happened because of fear and intimidation. God had a plan. God showed me what to do. But because of what people were saying or because, you know, situations, you just feel the pressure. You pull back from what God wanted to do. So Paul writes to the Galatians and he calls them back to the pure gospel. And the gospel that Paul preached was faith alone in Christ. Faith alone. Nothing else, nothing added, no works. That's what leads to justification. And today we're in part six, six and it's called God's adoption. So God's adoption. So we're going to turn to Galatians 4. Verses, and we're just going to... Are they already there? Party. It's a party? It's party. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. I didn't keep the law. <laughs> I'm condemned. <laughs> sorry, I thought it was part six. It's part eight. <laughs> Man, we've been flying through this thing. <laughs> but I know something. We're in Galatians 4. <laughs> so Galatians 4, verses 4 to 7 says this. Now listen to this, folks. This is Paul's argument to the Galatians that are going through this mixture and he's, they're going through these voices that are trying to pull them away. He says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those that were under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. And because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Now, folks, let me tell you something. That scripture should have your heart jumping for joy. Because you're no longer a slave. You're no longer, you know, a slave under the law of sin and death. You were once, a, you, once you were there, you were once a slave for the, you know, under sin and under death, but Hope came. Hope came in a manger thousands of years ago. And Jesus went to a cross. And folks, you've been redeemed. The Bible says, let the redeemed of, the, of, let the redeemed of God say so. You know, and how many times we, we were so quiet, but we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Sanctified. Adopted into a new family. And our Father is now God himself. Imagine, God himself. Sometimes I don't think that we think about that. We go through our things and God's in heaven. And, and, and I mean, God's here. He's in us. And we think that we're alone. But when you read through scripture and you start to understand, my goodness, what the deposit that God has put inside of me. I have everything that I need to succeed and to do this life. You know, when I was a young, I used to watch Ben-Hur. <laughs> Who knows who Ben-Hur is? Does everybody know who? Okay, if you don't know who Ben-Hur is, listen. It was back in the Roman times, you know, with the swords and the spears and the chariots and the horses, that type of program, all right? Now that you know my age. <laughs> yeah. So in this one episode, Ben-Hur, he's a Jew, and he's in prison on this Roman ship. Because that's where they put you. When anytime you did something wrong, they put you in the bottom of the ship. They didn't care if you died, got hit by a cannonball. Who cares? They just put you there. That's your job. You're a, you're a slave. And the ship is in a battle and it sinks. And Ben-Hur escapes, of course, because he's the main character. He always escapes. And he saves the life, the life of the Roman commander, whose name is Arius. And now Arius' only son is on the ship also, but in battle he dies. So... Arius ultimately adopts Ben-Hur as his son. And back in the Roman times, you could adopt, like today we think of adoption as kids, but back then they could adopt somebody even older than them as their son. So that's what the Roman commander does. He adopts Ben-Hur as his son. And in the scene, sorry, sorry, 
he adopts him as his son. He's pardoned for all of his supposed crimes. He's given a new name. And he's given all rights of the commander's inheritance. And in the scene where the adoption is announced, Arius takes off his ancestral ring, takes it off his finger. And he goes up to Ben-Hur and he puts it on his finger. And Ben-Hur, who is now called young Arius, looks up and he says, I've received a new life, a new home, and a new father. And that's what adoption does. It grafts us into a new family, a new family line. And it gives us new inheritance. And when we're adopted into God's family, it's the same thing. In the same way, when I was adopted into his family, I was given a new name. Were you not given a new name? And my name is written down in glory. Hallelujah. And I have a new eternal home in heaven. And I have a new father himself. And the Bible says we become co-heirs with Christ. Sharing in his glory and supporting each other as the body of Christ. And Paul tells the Galatians, through faith in Christ, you've been justified. And justification has declared you righteous in the sight of God. It's removed your condemnation. It's removed your guilt. It's removed the penalty of sin. And it's grafted you into God's family. And only by God's righteous act of his grace did he do that. And he's declared you and I righteous through faith in Christ. And Paul asked the question to them, why? Why would you want to move away from that? And we have to ask ourselves that today. Why, when I know all of this, why would I want to move away from what God has given me as an inheritance of what I have through him? Why do I want to go back to my old ways? Because nothing could ever, nothing that I could do or you could do could ever impress God. Or nothing that we could work for, or nothing that our little hearts could work for, keeping up with traditions and laws and try to make yourself better, it can't make you a child of God. Nothing, nothing like that can make you a child of God. Trying to work and trying to be good and trying to live a good life. But folks, the day that you bowed your knee, the day that you repented of your sin, the day that you put your faith in Christ, that's the day when you recognize you needed a Savior. And all of heaven, the Bible says, all of heaven rejoiced in the wonder-working power of God's grace, covering a sinner like me and covering a sinner like you, making him completely new, giving him a new name and adopting him you and I into his family. And Romans 8.15 says this, I didn't give you, or you didn't receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And you know that word Abba is very important in front of Father because it's the difference between a father and my father. I know Ben's a father, I know other people are fathers. But you see back there in the back, sitting way in the back, that's my dad. And when you look at Abba, Father, it kind of, it translates really into dad. And when I look at my dad, I'm in a relation of personal intimacy with my dad. There's a connection there between father and child. And when I put my faith in Christ to be saved, it's the exact same thing. God signed me and he sealed me with the Holy Spirit. And he put his spirit in me. And Abba is it's the legal means for me to address God in a relational, personal intimacy as my father. Jesus, that's how he, it's how he addressed his father. Paul, that's how he addressed the father. And now that we're grafted into this new family, into the, God has adopted us into that family. We have the same father. And if we have the same father, guess what? What's his? It's ours. It's ours. You know, so when you're going through your stuff and you, you're having some hard times, my goodness, how do we not look up? How do we not say, I'm going to see my father? Because I know my earthly father, if I'm having any problems or whatever, I'm I can go see him. I can talk things out. If I need something, he's going to help me. Why do we think any different than a heavenly father who has all things. 
And this is what Paul was trying to help the Galatians understand. Verse 9 says, But now that you know God, or rather you're known by God, how is it that you're turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Why are you turning back to your old ways? Why would you want to leave God and try to follow something and, and, and work your way to salvation? It never works. It doesn't work. Paul asked, do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? And Paul knew that there was no life in it. The only thing the law and legalism can do is make you a slave to it. It steals your joy of salvation. It makes people feel guilty instead of love because it stresses performance over relationship. And I know a lot of people that want nothing to do with God, but they're striving to be good people. They're striving to live a good life. But at the end of it all, if we don't have Christ, He's the only way. Ephesians 1, 4 to 5 says, For He chose us, He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. And in love, He says, He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and His will. It's an amazing thought, folks, because God's love for you, even when you didn't want anything to do with Him, and you were a sinner. It compelled him to come and to rescue you. And to rescue me. And just like Paul, he was calling the Galatians back to faith in Christ. And the finished work on the cross. And God is also calling his church back today. Why do you think he has us in Galatians? Why do you think he's bringing all the messages? Come back. Get out of the mixture. Stay away from the influential voices of darkness. That tries to change the gospel's truth into something more palatable. Something more easy to accept. And it has a message, folks. The, folk, the, the message in there, when you really le listen to a lot of those things on TV, and you don't watch what you're reading and different things, the message is, I can somehow, in my own ability, add to the finished work of the cross. That's the message. I can somehow help God help me be saved. Help me. You know, it's impossible. You can't. We have to clear this up in our minds now. It's Jesus crucified for the sins of men. It's Jesus crucified for the pardon of my sin. And it's Jesus crucified for my freedom. Plain and simple. Only the work of Jesus makes me right in the sight of God. Nothing but God's grace. Nothing. His grace and His grace alone. And Paul passionately, he tells, you know, the people, put your faith in Christ. He'll bring you to the proper relationship and right standing with God. And he'll make you a son or a daughter of God. Anything outside of that, Paul said, is condemned. It'll never work. And in the first part of Galatians, you see it. Paul says, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach another gospel other than the, what we're preaching right now, the, the, the pure gospel, it's condemned. He it says, let him be under a curse. Because it's the pure gospel of Christ that will make you free. It needs nothing to be added. Nothing. So when you get down to it, what does it mean to be adopted into God's family? Personally. You know, I was thinking about this and I said, you know, God is like, to me it means enjoying an unconditional love that's forever. An unconditional love. You know, because as a Christian, sometimes we can, we can still take on that mindset of someone who thinks I'm accepted into God's family as long as I don't mess up. You know, we can have that mindset. Oh, I was going good, but I, I messed up. You know, I got to... And it's like we have this system where, okay, we, we walk and then we mess up. Okay, well, like, apparently we have to start at the beginning over here and then we'll try to get some points, you know. But it, it, our minding, you know, of God and His love and His compassion for His children... I don't even treat my own children like that. You know, my, my kids mess up all the time. But I love them. I mean, to the ends of the earth, I love them. And I'll do whatever I can to help them and, and, and seek God for them and give them wisdom and talk with them and do whatever I have to do. So Paul's minding is kind of like, guys, why do you think of God in another form? Why do you want to leave and go back to those, those, those ritualistic religion that brings no peace and brings no freedom. You know, whenever we become children of God, 
There's so many privileges, eh? We're not hired help. That's what I was thinking the other day. We're not hired help. We're full-on family members. <laughs> I'm not no hired help. You know, I'm a son of the king, and you're a daughter of the king. You know, and we can ask for help whenever we need. As his children, he gave us promises to keep us and to guide us and to give us strength for today and wisdom for tomorrow and the promise that he would never leave us or forsake us. I've been praying about my bills forever. It's just, you know, sometimes we pray and we don't really believe it. You ever, you ever been there? You know, you kind of go to God casually and, well, I'm going to ask you because that's what I'm supposed to do. And, but, you know, the other day I was, I was pondering something and I know it was the Holy Spirit doing something in me and, and it was just like God was saying, I'm your father. Why don't you just listen for once? Just listen to me. Follow my ways. And we made, me and Roxanne made one decision. You know, I've been praying about my bills. We made one decision and God cleared half of my debt wow. in one day. One day. Gone. And I said, man, God, like, you're amazing. You're an amazing father. And it's like, okay, you're going to trust me for the other half? <laughs> you're going to follow me? Eh? Am I good? Do I not give good gifts to my children? There's a lot of, all of you here have a story where you can say where God has given you something and helped you somewhere and, and you know, worked a plan out for your life and did something for you because you're his children. And folks, adoption is the heart of the gospel. It's all about the relationship that God wants to have with us. Because your security is not dependent on anything else other than God's everlasting his unconditional love that he has for you as his children. And the more that we understand that, there's just this peace that comes in. We don't worry because we have a heavenly father that sees us, knows all things, and wants to help. Matter of fact, Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 4, it says, Let us approach the God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy to find grace to help us in our time of need. Max Licato says this, If anybody understands God's favor for his children, it's someone who has rescued an orphan from despair. He says, For that is what God has done for us. God has adopted you. He sought you. He found you. He signed the papers. And he took you home. And now you're in a new family. What an amazing God. What an amazing God. You know, that he would care so much for you and me. Sometimes I just sit and ponder that. What an amazing God. Lord, you, you're amazing. You care so much about your children. And that he would lay down his life to make a way to spend eternity with me. Sometimes I don't even like myself. <laughs> you ever get to that point? I don't even like myself. But you know what? God <laughs> said, no, I made a way. I sent my son. I went, Jesus went to the cross and died because I want to walk and talk with Pascal. I want to talk with Roger, and I want to talk with Mark, and I want to talk. Oh, Tyler's waving his hand. I want to talk with God. There you go. As his sons. And there are so many privileges. Let me go through a few privileges, but the, one of the privileges, we're able to talk to God and relate to him as a good and loving father. Psalms 103 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. I love and you get up in the morning, you just talk to God. When you're going through the day, you talk to God. When something comes up, you talk to God. You have a father who cares and who has compassion. Another one is God takes care of our needs. My goodness, I could stand here for months and months and months on end. God takes care of his children. God helps. He says, you don't have to worry about these things. Don't worry about what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear and don't worry about your needs. It says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he's going to give you everything you need. That's in Matthew 6. God gives us many good gifts, doesn't he? Gives us gifts of wisdom and understanding and counsel and knowledge. All of those things that without him, where would we be without God giving us these things? The Holy Spirit leads us and he guides us. Oh my goodness. We have the Holy Spirit of the living God. 
We have a counselor. We have somebody to lead us to truth every single day that we walk. <coughs> and he gives us each other. Isn't that amazing? You know, I was thinking the other day when I was making this message, I was like, when I was younger, my brother moved away. And when we were growing up, we were very knit and very close. And I only had one brother. And when he moved away, like I said, around 15 years ago or so, it tore my heart because it was like a piece of me was like leaving. But then God saves me and he brings me here. I've got more brothers, I'm not going to say that I need, but I've got a lot of brothers here. <laughs> you know, God set me in a family with people with interests like I have interests and even other interests that I can learn from and I can have, you know, time with and fellowship with. And I always wanted to have a sister. I never had a sister. I didn't know what it was like to tease a sister and to play jokes on. But God says, I'll give you a whole bunch. <laughs> I'll give you a whole bunch of sisters. You know, and he placed us here together to have brothers and sisters and be able to walk together. And let me close with this. Because I'm a child of God, now how do I respond being a child of God? Well, Ephesians 5, 1 says this. It says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. It says, we're to imitate our Father in heaven. This is how we bring honor to him, and this is how we show him our love. We're his children. We're his heirs. We're his ambassadors. So you know what? Next time that the voices try to come into your mind and try to discourage you, try to intimidate you into thinking that you're nothing, and that you have to do more in order to please God, or you have to do something, you know, like, like these voices were raising up with the Galatians, you have to do more than just put your faith in Christ. Don't move back into your old ways, like the Galatians were doing. Stand on the pure gospel. Stand on what you've been hearing from this pulpit for years. It's pure. Trust me, from a guy who went through the church, living as, as, as a young fellow all the way through the church, it's pure. It's not about the messenger. It's, it's pure. The gospel that's coming is pure. That you've been redeemed. You've been purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Through Christ, you've got new life. You've got a new home. You've got a new relationship. You've got new identity. And you've got a new family. And you remind those voices, listen, I am a chosen child of God. Amen. Amen. I am a chosen child of God. Co-heirs with Christ and my Father. My Father loves me. If you can just get that into your mind, my Father loves me. There's nothing that's going to happen into your life where you should feel like, oh, I'm done for. Because you can come to your Father. Anything happens in my life, like I said, in, in, in a regular relationship with my earthly Father, I can go to Him. I already know he's going to forgive me. I already know he's going to help me. How much more your heavenly father? You know, we sing that little chorus sometimes. I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. I was thinking, I was thinking that this morning when I was getting ready for church. I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. If it had not been for Jesus, where would I be? I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. Aren't you glad that Jesus came? Aren't you glad that you have a father who loves you? You've been grafted into a new line. You have a new inheritance. You have a new home. You have a new future. You have a new family. We are very privileged people. So if you don't know Christ, like Paul was, I would encourage you. I would just encourage you to call out to God. Ask him. Say, Lord. I'm seeing my recognition that I need a Savior, I, I, and I need to be redeemed. If I keep living the way that I am, there's no hope in it. The end, the Bible says, is death and destruction. But yet when we come to Christ, he puts this new hope in us, because he's the hope. And Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I'm the life. And he says, no man comes to the Father except through me. You're going to hear a lot of voices out there. You're going to hear a lot of things. You're going to see a lot of things. The world's full of it now. It's really uh, getting bad. 
I know it's always been bad, but it's the more that we go and the more that we walk, you're going to see that we need each other. We need, God put us in a family for a reason, so that we can sharpen each other, we can help each other, you know, walk and speak into each other's lives. And he's there, always, always, because he cares. And I know some people, sometimes, you know, you think of fathers and maybe you didn't have a father. Maybe a father left or a father didn't treat you very nice. But God's not like that. God made you with a purpose and a plan. And so Jeremiah says, says, I know the plans I have for you. A plan to prosper you and to give you a hope and to give you a future. And that future is with him. That future is one day we're all going to rejoice in the kingdom of heaven together and say, Father, and you'll be able to talk with him and walk with him. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Let's pray. Lord, how amazing you truly are. Lord, that you love us. God, when we look at the gospel, we look all the way through your word. Lord, we can just see the grafting of your love and your faithfulness towards us, Lord. That you love us so. And you're so compassionate towards your children. And God, this morning, I just thank you, Lord, that you came. You seen where we were. And your love reached out. God, to bring us back home and to bring us into a place of security. And bring us into a place, Lord, of fellowship with you. God, what an awesome privilege. Every single moment of the day, I can talk to you. And you relate right back. It's an amazing thought, Lord. You're so good. And Father, this morning, I just ask, Lord, that your word will fulfill its purpose, God, in the hearts of the minds of the people. God, that they will never forget. When you adopt, God, it's forever. And God, this is what you did for us. You adopted us into your family. My goodness, you give us such a, such a hope, such a future. And God, you promise we will never be alone again. God, we walk with you every single day. So God, we just thank you this morning. God, you came and you met us in, in worship today. God, your presence was here. My goodness, Lord. What a privileged people, God, that you come and you visit us. We praise your name today, God. We thank you for your goodness and for your faithfulness and for your mercy and for your grace. So, Lord, I pray that you would go with us today, that you would cover us, Lord, you would help us. Help us, God, to realize that you're always there and that you will steer us in the way that we ought to go. God, I thank you for your discipline. Lord, you discipline us because you love us. We heard it this morning. We don't have to fret when you do those things, God, because it's because you love us. You want to set us on the path where we're going to succeed. And we're going to be ambassadors for you and your word and the gospel to the people that are around us. So, Lord, we love you this morning. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.